Good morning, everyone. It is November 22nd, Thanksgiving week. I hope everybody gets a long uh, weekend. Nice to see uh, family or chosen family and friends. Um, it is 10 o'clock this rainy, at least in Seattle, gray day. And we are getting ready for uh, day two of electrification of the built environment. Thank you for joining us um, on our second day. I know it's been a little while since the first day. We've got Cher here from DNR Learn to finish our, our uh, program out. Okay, just as a reminder, you're all on mute, but you can submit questions in the chat at any time. Um, Diane will get them to share, and uh, this is being recorded as we speak, um, and we'll uh, post the recording up on the Lighting Design Labs website within about a week. Give me maybe a couple days because of the holiday. Uh, and there's a survey that pops up after we close out the webinar, so please take that and let us know um, any uh, suggestions you have or um, maybe topics that you'd like to see. Um, see us bring to you. Um, we just have a few more courses for the rest of this year. We've got um, HVAC systems testing for energy efficiency. First time we've had that um, will be very important to any of you who are going to be um, or who have buildings that are subject to tune-up ordinance or um, building performance. Um, stuff and then a really cool case study on December 6th um, of a, a CO2 heat pump water heater project of a hundred hundred unit building in Belltown in Seattle um, and you can't click the links now but uh, when you get the slide deck or just keep it in your mind at lightingdesignlab.com is where you can sign up for those all right, I am going to hand this over to Cher and Diane and turn off my camera. So there's Thank your you. presenter, yeah. Okay, so let me make sure. Yes, I'm sorry. So good morning, everybody, I'm just, up here, just give me a second. I want to make sure you guys are seeing the right thing. I think so. Um, so I think we are about ready to start. Yeah. So hello again. Welcome, welcome. Yeah, it's been a uh, it's been a couple of weeks since we last saw each other. My name is Cher Griffith Taylor. I'm with DNR Learn, uh, and I'll be your host today. I'll be taking you through the second part of this module on electrification of the built environment. Thank you for the introduction. Uh, and my colleague Diane is also here in the background, just making sure um, that we can uh, get rolling and go smoothly today. We're booked for about two hours, uh, but don't worry, just like before, we've designed uh, the session to include a lot of breaks and interactive exercises because our experience confirms that that's the best way to deliver this kind of content. So the only uh, extra piece of or a device that you'll need is your smartphone, uh, but you can probably you can do it um, from your computer browser as well well all right so yeah get ready to engage with me engage with the content uh, the chat function is open to you so feel free to put your questions in there um yeah and we have a lot of breaks so um feel free to come off mute if you want at those times to ask any questions or if something was unclear um but yeah also feel free to put it in the chat so let's get started Excellent. Um, hold on, just quick check. I want to make sure that everybody can see. Okay, great. Yeah, so my name is Sherry Griffith Taylor. Um, if there are any folks that weren't here on our Tuesday session, uh, electrification is my game, and I have over 10 years of experience in the energy space. Um, yeah, like doing research and then on utility rate pair advocacy, policy development, and now strategic planning on electric vehicles as well. So you're in good hands. Uh, and again, for those folks that um, 
that maybe weren't in the Tuesday session or the ones even that even if you were again it's been a couple um, weeks since we saw each other so we just wanted to quickly review what we learned previously and just have a space here in the front um, if you guys if you have any questions um, but so we'll do this quick review we'll do the quick questions and survey and then we'll go into a review so um, so don't worry you'll be all caught up in just a few minutes all right, so join at this QR code or at slido.com. Um, use the hashtag electric one. All right, so introductory survey. How many of you guys attended day one? Are you guys able to get to the slido? I'm not seeing anyone yet. Yep, it's I can get to it. This is Katie. <laughs> Thanks. All right, one respondent. That's great. So if you're using your smartphone, you can just um, point your camera at the QR code there, or you can join through your browser at slido.com. Uh, this is Katie again. Are... Just. Uh... I just want to, there's three questions that it ask, is asking you to answer, but just so everybody knows, you can click like send or whatever before you answer those those longer questions, <laughs> the takeaway questions. Yeah. Yeah, so just, um, so just three questions. Did you attend day one? What was your biggest takeaway from day one? And if you have any questions about day one. Uh, just want to get a feel for where your guys' heads are at, um, but again, don't worry, we're going to go through a quick review, and again, we'll have other um, opportunities to make sure that, um, that everyone is on the same page. Um, but yeah, it would be helpful if you guys just quickly put in some answers to the questions. Let's look alive, my lovely audience. Okay, I'm not going to spend too much more time on this poll, but yeah, yeah, don't worry. Uh, as I said, we're going to catch up. So thanks for this. Um, thanks for this response to question number two. What was your biggest takeaway from day one? Yeah, don't remember. I'm not surprised. But again, don't worry. You're in good hands. We're going to go through a quick review. Okay. I'm going to give this um, just one more minute and then we're going to move forward so that we can start that review. Okay, so let's jump into the agenda for today. So thank you for your uh, for your feedback on that Slido survey. Um, so for our agenda today, we're going to review electrification. What are the benefits? What are the challenges? What is electrification? Uh, and then we're going to talk about mitigating the challenges with energy efficient tech. Uh, so last time we started on heat pumps, so we'll do a review there. Um, we did heat pumps mostly for the residential setting, so um, new content for this uh, for this delivery. We'll be looking at commercial heat pump water heaters. We'll also be looking at energy efficiency in the kitchen, and then some other energy efficiency tech that we've all kind of just grouped together in this category of other. Uh, and then we're going to look at how we can mitigate challenges uh, with incentives. Okay. So back to basics, what is electrification, right? So remember we said it's just replacing technologies that use fossil fuels. So that could be coal, oil, or natural gas with technologies that use electricity as a source of energy. So, you know, quickly think of like a gas stove, electrifying a gas stove would mean using an electric stove instead. And therefore you cut out that, uh, like that natural gas 
products um, that you'd be using on the stove and you replace it with electricity or same thing for like an electric vehicle versus a gas powered vehicle, right? So there are many benefits to electrification. So with the transportation example, you know, a gas burning vehicle produces a lot of noise and pollution when it burns that gas, whereas an electric vehicle is quiet and has no tailpipe emissions. Um, but, you know, when you're assessing the benefits of electrification, you have to consider the resources used to generate that electricity. Uh, and there are going to be more benefits when the electricity is generated from a source that is emissions free or clean, uh, such as wind, solar power or hydroelectricity. Um, so not all electricity is produced using renewables in the U.S., uh, but as we saw, Washington uh, state is a leader in clean electricity generation with the majority of their generation being produced using hydro hydropower. So that's great. All right, so we know what electrification is, what are the benefits? So we discussed last time that uh, electrification reduces risks to health. Uh, it lowers the risk of fire and ex uh, an explosion, because of course gas is flammable, that explodes very, uh, very typically. Uh, then you have energy savings, helps save money, which, that leads to reduced electricity bills or utility bills. Uh, then there's increased comfort due to quiet and more consistent heating or cooling technologies. Uh, all of those will be electric. And then, of course, there are benefits to the climate in terms of reduced greenhouse emissions. Okay, so remember health, safety, energy savings, comfort, and climate. Excellent. All right, so now uh, we are going to talk about the challenges. Again, like pretty briefly, like what we talked about uh, last class. So uh, we have all those benefits, but of course there are gonna be challenges. The two major challenges to electrification are the cost of going electric uh, because uh, advanced efficiency technologies typically cost more than their upfront uh, gas counterparts. So again, just think of electric vehicles or even an electric stove. Um, though this in part, or the high upfront cost is partially justified due to the lower overall cost uh, of ownership of that appliance. So while new all electric systems may cost more upfront, electricity is often the cheapest form of energy per unit. Um, so uh, every time you're using that uh, energy source, you are saving versus um, or relative to like a, a traditional, uh, traditional technology using uh, say gas power, for example. And then the other big challenge to electrification is grid stability. So on a healthy, balanced grid, the supply of electricity must at least be equal to the demand for electricity. So if, um, if demand outstrips supply, that's when you can start to see uh, parts of the system failing, uh, you'll get um, blackouts or like brownouts. Um, and so if every building switched from gas to electric heating, cooking and cooling overnight, that's like a massive uh, immediate shift and the grid might not be able to meet all that demand at once, okay? So then how can we mitigate these challenges, especially on the grid, we can use energy efficient technology. So we are going to look at uh, space heating and cooling now, but it's one of four major applications where energy efficient technology can be deployed to decrease relative energy consumption, thereby mitigating grid stress. So we're going to look at space heating and cooling first. Um, then there is domestic water heating. Then there's cooking. And as I said, we have this other final category we define as other. Uh, so last time we talked about space heating and cooling, uh, this can be achieved using an electric heat pump and the he electric heat pump is currently the most efficient available technology for space heating and cooling, both in the commercial and residential sectors. All right, so what is a heat pump? Check out these pictures. So a heat pump is very simply, it's a, it's a, a device that transfers heat from one medium to another. So there are many different types and configurations of heat pumps, um, but we're gonna look at, we looked at residential heat pumps, and now we're gonna look at uh, commercial uh, or, or heat pumps in the commercial settings as well. So again, uh, the heat pump is like the most impactful um, energy saving 
device uh, when it comes to space heating and cooling. So a study in San Francisco found that widespread adoption of electric heat pumps is the single most important lever considered for reducing emissions. Because again, these heat pumps are all electric. So newer heat pumps use advanced refrigerant technologies that still work great even at negative 20 degrees Fahrenheit. So yeah, heat pump transfers heat from one medium to another, and you might think that they won't work in cold climates because, you know, there's no heat to begin with. Um, but, you know, it doesn't feel warm to us. Um, but uh, with these advanced heat pump technologies, these advanced refrigerants can really um, just take whatever heat uh, is outside or uh, in that, um, that ambient atmosphere and then uh, transfer that heat inside to where we need it. So heat pumps very impactful and powerful technology. And we're going to review heat pumps pretty simply in this module, but uh, just a quick plug, uh, quick plug for my colleague Christy. She leads a separate training, which takes a deep dive into the world of heat pumps. So if you are uh, hankering for more information on heat pumps, definitely check that one out. That one should be available to you. All right. So yes, uh, heat pumps for comfort heating and cooling. So you can also use heat pumps for domestic water heating. So uh, you're probably familiar with residential heat pump water heater systems, but we're gonna look at commercial heat pump water heater systems, which work in domestic applications. Right. So again, heat pumps and especially the use for space heating and cooling or domestic water heating, it's a great way to mitigate grid stress or like you know, stress on the grid when uh, demand for electricity might outstrip supply. Okay, so what is a commercial heat pump water heater, right? Uh, a commercial or a central, it used to be called central heat pump water heaters. It's defined as a heat pump water heater system that serves more than four dwelling units or serves commercial loads that need a total of, uh, or a, need at least 120 gallons of storage volume and or more than six kilowatt hours, uh, I'm sorry, six kilowatts of input power. So uh, with heat pump water heaters, the lines can get really blurry with different equipment and configurations and system designs. But um, when while the configurations may change, when we're talking about commercial heat pump water heaters, focus on the size of the system. So the size of the load, right? So is it like, um, you know, a uh, hundred and it's 120 gallons of storage volume. That would be the, the volume, right? Or is it, or the load, is it like four, at least four dwelling units for a commercial heat pump water heater? Or, or look at the input power of the system. So for commercial heat pump water heaters, we need uh, in excess of six kilowatt hours um, of input. I'm sorry, six kilowatts, sorry, of input power. So that is the definition for a commercial system. Um, but you, as you can see in this picture, um, you can kind of gang different heat pumps together um, to achieve uh, like a cumulative impact. Uh, but we're going to look at some of that um, shortly. So a uh, quick aside, of course, you know, commercial heat pump water heaters, what are the applications? Obviously, bathing, cleaning, right? Cleaning yourself, cleaning uh, dishes in the kitchen. So uh, domestically, you can use these um, for showers, for dishwashers, and then also it's great for uh, restaurants as well, right? Okay, so again, residential versus commercial. So basically, you, you're seeing here a sliding scale because again, um, you can uh, configure these systems in a lot of different ways. So this training focuses on commercial or central heat pump water heating systems. They're a great fit for multifamily builds, buildings, right? So uh, as I was saying, residential systems, you can kind of gang them together um, to get uh, a commercial, or you can gang them together to serve commercial settings, uh, as shown in the picture in the middle. So right under where it says six kilowatts, um, you see uh, a little picture there. It has several um, residential type heat pumps um, kind of uh, uh, connected together um, to serve a commercial building. Right. So the components found in an integrated system like the one shown on the left, which is going to which is under the residential or like yellow, uh, yellow side of the sliding scale. It's unitary or integrated. It's an all in one package system. It's pretty small. 
okay? It's supposed to serve just like one uh, dwelling unit, um, but then you can get uh, to on the other end of the spectrum um, under the blue or the commercial side on the on to the right, and you have the larger um, commercial systems, um, which they yeah they can be com commercial they can be custom engineered, and uh, they're just all it's kind of like not all packaged together as neatly as the small system because in the small system it, everything's integrated into that one system for commercial systems especially if you're talking about one with a large load or large volume of of um, uh, like water being stored and served um, then you're going to need like a whole room to hold all your heat pump equipment so let's take a look we'll take a look um, at that more closely uh, shortly all right, but uh, let's think about the impacts of increasing energy efficiency with commercial heat pump water heaters. All right, so again, they've been shown to be very significant in reducing energy usage in multifamily buildings. Heat pumps are more efficient than electric resistance heating and way more uh, efficient than natural gas heating systems. And of course, they create zero carbon emissions. So now this slide, um, those two uh, exploded pie, pie charts, pie graphs, um, they summarize proportionally how much energy is used in a multifamily building by different building systems. So, um, you know, we're looking at HVAC, uh, we're looking at, uh, so we're looking at, um, we're looking at first the graph or the pie chart on the left. So we have H back, back at 13% of building energy, total building energy uses. Uh, you have uh, common plugs and lights, another 25%. But you can see uh, domestic hot water temperature maintenance is 10% of the multifamily buildings of uh, total energy consumption. And then this uh, domestic hot water is, uh, primary heating for domestic hot water is another 15%. So overall, just the hot water of the multifamily building is taking up 25% of the building's annual energy use. All right. And then in the bar, in the pie chart on the right, um, this, it's the same building, but it was retrofitted. Um, it was retrofitted with a commercial heat pump water heating system. All right. So the right graph shows the effect of implementing that new system. The amount of energy used by the domestic hot, hot water system is reduced from 25% to just 8%, right? So that's 17% uh, annual energy savings were created. So very, very impressive. All right. Heat pump applications, right? So shown here are some examples of heat pumps being used for hot water in different settings. So again, you have the residential system uh, on the leftmost slide. Again, it's pretty small. You can just like stick it in a closet. Everything's integrated into like one uh, device. Then you have the um, multifamily system. That's the middle image. It shows several smaller heat pumps that are kind of aligned in a gang to provide domestic hot water for a multifamily building. So these heat pumps are connected to a central system that serves all uh, 56 units of the building uh, that's shown in the picture. So that's the middle picture where it says multifamily. Uh, and then on the rightmost image, uh, it's an image from a commercial kitchen in Vermont. And if you look closely in the upper right corner of the image, you can see a little bit of the heat pump that's being used there to provide domestic hot water for the restaurant, all right? So just a review of like the different heat pump applications uh, for domestic hot water. Next, okay. Right, so on the right, uh, I'm sorry, on the left side, um, you're going to see an integrated or unitary piece of equipment, just like the one we saw on the previous slide that was in the closet. So this is typically found in a residential application because it's small uh, compared to a larger commercial uh, system, right, which I'm going to show you it's on the right. Right. So again, this whole room over here on the right side of the um, of the slide where it says Jackson Apartments, it's this is an image from 
our whole room that uh, this apartment building uses to house its commercial heat pump water heater system, right? But we're going to see that it's basically all the same components that you find in the integrated system. It's just, of course, uh, for serving like a much greater load. So yeah, everything's like way bigger. So um, you can see the first arrow there, the yellow arrow. So the heat pump, it's going from the heat pump in the integrated system to where the heat pump is in the uh, commercial heat pump water heater system in that room in the Jackson Apartments. Um, the same for the primary storage. So um, you can see where the, the green arrow originates in the residential system on the left side of the image. And then, um, yeah, you have the primary storage um, containers or tanks um, towards the right of the image in the right. Uh, and then we have the temperature maintenance system. Uh, then we also have like the controls here. So it's on the front of the unitary system and it's in this uh, little call out box um, in, in kind of outlined in purple in the um, over in the Jackson apartments. Okay, and we're gonna take a look at this now. All right, so uh, this is a great little uh, exercise that, again, my colleague, Christy, she's a heat pump expert. She has designed this for us. So you're gonna be taking a look at the Jackson Apartments, okay? Um, you can choose to just read the case study or you, or I highly recommend that you click on the interactive um, and take a look at, the, at this room. So I'm gonna, oh, oh, hang on, sorry. I'm gonna click it. I've already put it into the chat for them. Thank you. Thank you, Diane. Yes, basically, you click it, you just click. Oh, can you all see me? Can you all see my slides here? Yes. OK, so just click on um, Explore the System. And it says enter the mechanical room. It'll take you into this room here, right? And you can basically click on everything to learn about it. It's going to quick. It's going to swivel around a little bit slowly, but Feel free to click in the window and kind of drag your to move around um, just to move around a little quicker. So you can see all the different components um, and then all these uh, little icons, they um, highlight different parts of the system. You can click on to read or like learn more about it. Yeah, right. So remember we were talking about uh, the primary hot water storage. That's what it looks like. Um, and there's videos, I think this one. I think that your your activity and thing link is is removing your voice. Oh, yeah, it's hard to it's, uh, it's very um, processing power intensive. Yeah, um, but I hope that was a good uh, example. I just wanted to you to kind of show you how you can use the interactive explorer. Um, but yeah, you have uh, about seven minutes, audience, to get in there, explore the system, or you. You can review the case study, um, you can just read it. Um, but yeah, definitely I recommend doing interactive exploration and think about what are some of the benefits of commercial heat pump water heaters based on what you're seeing or reading and what other questions do you have about commercial heat pump water heaters, right? So I'm gonna give you another six minutes on this. It will, uh, I'll be back at, um, about 34 past the hour.
Okay, just two more minutes on the exercise, uh, either reading the case study or doing the interactive exploration. So what are some benefits of commercial heat pump water heaters? And what other questions do you have about commercial heat pump water heaters? I will try to answer them. Okay, everybody should be back by now. Uh, let's look. Let's look at the next slide, which is a quick Slido poll on exploring the real-world examples of commercial heat pump water heaters. So, just those same two questions that I said before: What are some benefits of commercial heat pump water heaters, based on everything that we have been uh, discussing and everything that you read or explored? And then, um, what other questions do you have? That's right, energy savings, absolutely. And of course, you know, they serve bigger loads than the unitary or residential systems. All right, what other questions do you have about commercial heat pump water heaters? Does it take longer to heat water back up in the heat pump tanks? Well, yeah, it would, especially if it's if the tank is very, very large. I mean, it depends on the size of the tank, basically. Um, but for the commercial systems, we would assume that it is a big tank. Um, but yeah, they do have, you know, they will have these controls uh, and it's advanced technology. So they want to make everything as convenient as possible. So um, certainly it does take some time, but I mean, like not, not too much. And if you're reading, I mean, you know, there is like a temperature maintenance system. Um, so they are trying to keep that, uh, that water uh, at a consistent temperature so that you don't have to heat it up um, from scratch unless the tank is, is almost empty. All right, we're just going to move on from here. Thank you for participating in our Slido poll here. And next up, we have a break. Uh, let's take five minutes. 
so about um, 42 after the hour. Let's get back here. Okay, quick five minute break. Thank you, everybody. See you guys in five minutes. Okay, everybody, uh, we should be back from the break. It was just five minutes. 
Um, it was just five minutes. Uh, let's get back into our work on energy efficient technologies. We're looking at different technologies that can uh, mitigate some of the challenges of uh, electrification. So next up, uh, so we did uh, space heating and cooling, we did domestic hot water. Now we're gonna look at cooking, right? Energy efficiency in uh, energy efficient cooking equipment, uh, which works in uh, domestic hot water applications. Use of technology covered in this section, again, great way to mitigate uh, grid stress. All right, so you can probably imagine that more energy is used in the kitchen uh, than in other rooms of the building. So either to heat things up or to just run appliances, right? So this graph is from kitchens.com. And here we can see that food preparation is responsible for about 35% of energy consumption in a full service restaurant with another 8% going to refrigeration. So yeah, uh, that's a lot, right? Uh, incorporating energy efficient technologies in restaurants and other commercial applications can further decrease energy consumption. And that's what we're trying to do because we do want, um, you know, we want most heating and cooling um, and appliances, we want them to be electric because it's good for the planet and it saves people money. But if everyone does this immediately, um, our grid might not be ready for it yet. Um, but there are certain kinds of energy efficient technologies that we can use that will um, mitigate grid stress and reduce uh, energy consumption. So we talked about um, water heaters, we talked about uh, heat pumps, and now we're gonna look at um, uh, energy costs from the kitchen. So where in the kitchen can we deploy energy efficient uh, technology, like in commercial kitchens, right? Uh, now let's check out this video on residential uh, kitchens, like increasing energy efficiency in residential kitchens. So the YouTube link, so I'm sorry, you're not gonna be able to see this video if I play it. So I'm gonna put this link in the chat. Okay. So this Can is you a change YouTube. your slide change. Did you did you change your slide? Oh um, I'm seeing it on break. Oh I'm so sorry. Um are you what are you seeing now? Okay now I've saw the, the man with the Okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay. I'm sorry. So let me just recap this. Uh, I did put the link to the video in the chat. Um, but as I said, we've looked at space heating and cooling and we looked at domestic water heating. And now we're going to take a look at uh, energy efficiency, energy efficient technology in the kitchen. So cooking equipment, right? Again, it's a great way to mitigate grid stress. Um, yeah. And as I said, um, in this graph from kitchens.com, we can see that food preparation is responsible for 35% of energy consumption in a full service restaurant and another 8% uh, going to refrigeration. Great opportunity to deploy some energy efficient uh, technology that can decrease energy consumption relative to uh, other technologies. Um, and then, yeah, we're gonna look at a residential application. So in a residential kitchen, how can we increase energy efficiency? And what are the other benefits apart from just um, reducing reducing energy consumption, right? You might think that there's not a good compelling case to invest in energy efficient cooking equipment uh, in the residential sector. But in addition to the energy cost savings, consider the health benefits as well, which is what this video is about. Nitrogen dioxide is one of the main pollutants released from gas stoves, and that's linked to asthma and worsens pre-existing health problems. So in fact, gas stoves can cause indoor nitrogen dioxide levels that are worse than outdoor air next to power plants and highways. So think about that. Think about transportation pollution. Think about being at ground level um, on the side of like a busy highway, all right? Um, you can actually get that same um, poor air quality in your kitchen just by like using all four of your burners at once or more if you have more, right? 
Um, so let's, uh, yeah, the video, it's not a long video. When you were playing it, um, it's about to be finished, basically. Okay, so just a few more minutes, so what, like one more minute for you to finish watching the Berkeley Labs video. Uh, it's pretty cool that they do these uh, kind of interactive tests and that they record it to show people, show people what they're doing, what they're doing in the lab. Okay, cool. I'm going to move on in just one more minute. Okay, great. We should be just about finished with that video now. Um, so yeah, nitrogen dioxide, it's one of the main pollutants from gas stoves. It's a link to childhood asthma and otherwise healthy children, and it worsens pre-existing health conditions. The EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency, sets outdoor standards for nitrogen dioxide, but gas stoves can also cause uh, nitrogen dioxide levels that are, again, worse than outdoor air next to uh, gas power plants and highways. So another reason that you might want to consider switching to not just a more efficient uh, electric stove, but a safer one as well, one that's um, beneficial to your, to your health and to the health of your kids in your household. Okay, so uh, let's explore a kitchen upgrade. So we're going to give about 10 minutes to this. So read this article. I'm going to put the link in the chat. Okay, so I put the article link in the chat. So just uh, take a look at that. Um, it's about grid stress and answer the following questions. All right, it's about a restaurant that um, invested in some energy efficiency retrofitting. So think about um, the restaurant's overall goal. Think about the strategies that the restaurant used to meet this goal. And then think about you know, the results of this implementation strategy. So as I said, uh, this uh, case study, it's about the restaurant, but you know these incentives or this uh, retrofitting program that they uh, that the restaurant was able to um, to leverage from um, from the state, it the state offers these programs because they want to help um, individuals or you know restaurants and businesses mitigate grid stress because everybody has a part to play. So that's why they offer these programs. And if you uh, read the case study, you can see how um, yeah the the results of this uh, retrofitting strategy. So while you're reading it, I can just quickly uh, give you a rundown. So the kitchen, it's called Public House. Uh, it's in Vermont. It is a barn that's been turned into, it's an old barn that's been turned into a fine dining restaurant. And uh, if you've ever been in a barn, <laughs> I can, I, I guess you can kind of um, imagine uh, the kinds of, uh, ener the kind of energy nightmare consumption uh, situation that's happening. You know, they're largely insulated and this is in Vermont too. So, you know, you have to keep, if it's a fine dining restaurant, you want to keep like a pretty good or like kind of warm indoor air temperature uh, so that your guests uh, can eat uh, in relative comfort and then your servers can work in relative comfort and then even in the kitchen, uh, of course, it's going to get hot in there, but, you know, you want to emphasize the comfort. Um, so uh, what is the goal then? The goal is to run a successful business and not spend all of your money just trying to keep the place at a comfortable temperature. 
and of course it's in Vermont so it's you know they're kind of progressive and they want to also cut their carbon footprint they want to make the restaurant more energy efficient and therefore more profitable so how the restaurant participated in Vermont's deep energy retrofit program so they added insulation to the barn they installed heat pumps they installed high efficiency propane furnaces they installed led lighting and they uh, installed high efficiency fan motors um, and they later installed solar oops, i'm sorry they later installed solar panels as well on the roof and they're generating a lot of their electricity that they need on site right and they're gonna pl they're planning to install uh, energy storage as well so um, they participated in the state's program. They did all these uh, installations and they got you know, some financial incentives from the state program to assist them to make all these installations. What were the results? So they're more productive. They're serving more meals than they did before. I bet they didn't think about that. They just wanted to get warm or again, get to that comfortable temperature. But overall, all that comfort means enhanced productivity. They're serving 42% more meals and they're seeing a 52% de decrease in the energy used to serve meals. So that's actually a really impactful, uh, those investments are very impactful. All right. All right. Quick Slido quiz on that article. What was the restaurant's overall goal? Like we reviewed this. All right. What strategy did the restaurant used to meet the goal. And then what were the results of implementing the strategy? All right, if you're not finished up uh, reading that case study yet, um, whenever you're done, uh, we are here at the Slido poll. Just a quick Slido poll to just check your understanding of the case study. Is anyone at the poll yet? I'm seeing zero activity on the poll. All right, I'm gonna give you guys maybe another five, four minutes. Oh, I think I see some chat coming through. Okay.
Is anyone at the slider poll? Happening there. Yeah. Oh, my beautiful audience. Where's everybody? You guys must be finished with the case study now. No one has any answers to these questions. Pretty simple. What was the restaurant's goal? As we said, they wanted to uh, become more profitable. They wanted to reduce their carbon footprints. They wanted to make the restaurant more energy efficient. They wanted to have a successful business and they were just losing money right out their barn doors, just throwing money out there towards their energy bills. Very expensive to keep an old barn at a comfortable temperature for their fine dining clientele. So then what strategy did they use to meet the goal? Well, they participated in uh, Vermont State's Deep Energy Retrofit Program. Through the program, they added insulation to the barn, they installed heat pumps. They uh, added a high efficiency propane furnace or furnaces, actually. Uh, they installed LED lighting. They installed high efficiency fan motors and heat pump water heaters. And then they even went so far as to install solar panels as well. And they have plans to install energy storage on top of that to reduce the restaurant's peak demand and basically to uh, produce the majority of the energy that the restaurant needs on site from those solar panels. All right, and then what were the results of implementing this strategy? So uh, the results of their participation in this deep energy retrofit program, uh, increased productivity. They're serving 42% more meals and they are seeing a 52% decrease in the energy used to serve meals. I'm seeing like no responses to the slide of poll. Is anyone out there? I know it's Thanksgiving week, I know. All right, well, uh, we're going to press on. I think we're pretty much done with the slide poll. All right, increasing energy efficiency in the kitchen, right? So uh, in both residential and commercial settings, typically we're talking about enhancing the efficiency of appliances like dishwashers, ovens, cooktops, fryers, uh, jet ventilation, and refrigeration. Okay, and we'll review all of these in more detail, but this is typically the appliances we're looking at in the kitchen. So energy efficient dishwashers. We already mentioned this a few slides back, but heat pump water heaters are a great application for heating water used in dishwashing machines because they're extremely energy efficient and they cool the area in which they're located. So they can, so they can be used to offset um, like heat loads in, in hot kitchens, right? And again, just make it more comfortable in there while you're in there. So again, great for commercial kitchens, right? Uh, so, yeah, heat pump water heaters are great for dishwashing. Next, electric cooktop. So I'm sure many of you are familiar with the radiant electric cooktop cooktops, like the one on the left in the picture or on this slide. Radiant cooktops are more efficient than gas cooktops uh, since they heat the surrounding area less, which means they waste less energy, but they're not as precise or quick cooking as gas cooktops, right? Uh, there's another kind of electric cooktop aside from the radiant uh, radiant cooktops. It's called an elect. I'm sorry. It's called an induction cooktop, 
right? So it's also electric, um, but instead of just like heating up some burners, which then heat up the pan and the food, um, they have, uh, they generate like the induction cooktops, they generate uh, heat through a magnetic field instead of transferring the heat uh, indirectly. So the heating element under the glass of the ceramic sur or ceramic surface is a coil which produces a magnetic field around it uh, when you turn on the burner and uh, turn on the electric current, right? And then the, the electrons in your cookware, so your frying pan or your uh, Dutch oven, um, they react to that magnetic field that the copper coil is producing, and then the pot heats up. Right, um, but you can only use um, magnetic material on an induction cooked up. So if you used, um, you know, for some reason you use like some kind of cookware that is not magnetic, then you won't be able to use an induction cooked up because the the goal or the the aim of the induction cooktop is to generate that magnetic field between uh, the copper coil under the surface and your actual uh, cook cookware, right? Your pot or your pan, right? Um, yeah. The friction of, of the vibration um, between or, or caused by the uh, magnetic field, that's what heats up the cook cooking vessel. And induction cooktops heat only the pan and the food, right? So there's little to no heat of the surrounding area, which again makes it more efficient. Right, and as you can see here, this is a kind of just an endorsement from an Australian chef, Neil Perry. I don't know if you know him. Um, they're far easier to cool. Uh, they're far easier to clean down after use. The induction cooktops. Um, that's one of the main reasons that you would choose them in an industrial kitchen over a uh, uh, over a gas uh, stove. And it's much faster to cook with induction. Right, you can increase or drop the temperature more quickly. Basically, you can just be a whole lot more precise. And again, uh, because of this, um, this, this rapid responsiveness of the technology, that's what makes it more efficient uh, than again a radiant electric cooktop or certainly a gas cooktop, gas range. Right. All right, so let's do a little deeper dive into the chef's perspective. We're going to take up 10 minutes here. Um, so I'm going to uh, get back on the mic at like uh, 15 minutes past the hour. But basically, I'm going to ask you to read this article. And I'm going to put the link in the chat. I'm going to say it's the chef's article. Okay, I'm going to put the uh, link in the chat and then just uh, read the article and to explore the chef's hesitation to give up gas and uh, think about the potential solutions um, kind of highlighted in the article. So why are some reasons that chefs might not want to give up gas stoves and think about some of the reasonable solutions presented in the article. Okay, so I'll give you guys 10-ish minutes to, uh, to read that article.
okay, you should be almost done now. Um, so we're going to have a quick Slido poll next. And again, it's those two main questions. After you've read this uh, article exploring the chef's hesitation to give up gas, uh, what are some reasons that chefs might not want to give up on gas stoves? And what are some reasonable solutions uh, presented in the article? Okay, up next is a Slido poll. All right, chef's perspective. See one person typing something. Thank you. I see two people typing something. That's excellent. Come on, guys. Quick article. Um, you can do this. So what are some reasons why chefs might not want to give up using gas stoves? All right, they're used to gas stove. It's how they learn to cook. That's so true. Um, you know, we, we're in our comfort zones. Yes, okay, they may, they're they opposed to change. Uh, yeah, probably because of that same first reason. They're used to gas stoves. It's what they've used all along. That's how they learn to cook. So they feel like they can use, they know how to use that technology well. They know it's like some tips and tricks also, I guess. And then also electricity, um, they, they feel like electricity is more expensive. Um, you know, again, per unit produced, electricity is among like the cheapest uh, of energies. Um, but yeah, definitely an electric stove is going to cost more than a gas stove, right? Yes, and uh, the third response is saying yes, is the initial cost of those induction stoves, especially. So, you know, radiant cook stoves are one thing. Uh, induction cook stoves, again, it's advanced technology, so it is going to cost more. But again, as we've been saying, you know, with this energy efficient technology, a lot of times it's worth it because uh, moving forward as you use the appliance, you'll be saving relative to what you would have if you didn't, if you weren't using an electric appliance. And because um, electricity per unit is so cheap to produce uh, and so cheap to buy, um, then overall you're going to have lower total cost of ownership savings, which really justifies uh, that higher initial cost. Okay, so thank you for your responses. This is great. Uh, question number two, what are some reasonable solutions presented in the article? Um, the first response that I'm seeing here, so using electric induction for some tasks and a gas or wood fire for others. That's great. That's that's perfect. Uh, second, uh, supplementing gas with induction stoves to get chefs used to using them. That's excellent. That's, that's, that's correct. Um, yeah, in, using induction over uh, the electric range. And if cost was an issue for it, for an induction range, you know, keep your gas stove and use an electric oven, you know, for, for your oven needs. And then uh, focus on heating with induction and wood. Excellent. Excellent. Thank you for your participation. Great. So yeah, as I just said, you know, one reasonable solution might be to keep a gas stove in the uh, in the chef kitchen, but use an electric oven instead. So let's quickly look at electric ovens. So according to uh, Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratories, a standard electric oven has a cooking efficiency of about 12%, while a self-cleaning electric oven, uh, these self-cleaning models, they usually have more insulation in the oven case, um, that has a cooking efficiency of about 14%, right? So now this might not seem like a lot, but you have to compare it to the cooking efficiency of a uh, of a gas oven. So normal gas ovens have a cooking efficiency of about 6% and only 7% for self-cleaning models. So again, uh, that's, you know, that's 100% uh, more. 
Um, and then also electric ovens, both the wall or the range oven, they are great, especially for roasting and broiling because they have a drier cooking environment and they provide even heat and can be configured, you know, in different ways. You can have it under your range or you can have it just like in a wall, right? So yeah, real quick on electric ovens, but uh, pretty versatile and uh, enhanced cooking efficiency. So again, like this is the deal with electric appliances. If you're gonna use electricity over other forms of energy, it's gonna be more efficient. Um, and yeah, it is. it might cost a little bit more, but again, think about your savings over time, right? Okay, and then we have some additional uh, energy efficiency uh, technologies here for the kitchen. So um, you can uh, you can upgrade your fryers. Uh, there are a large selection of electric fryers. They are compact and easy to set up and have efficient startup and recovery times. Right. Then, of course, uh, refrigeration. So it's not like you were going to go out and get like a gas refrigerator, um, but refrigerators are opened often and they need to maintain their internal temperature. So there are a few ways that you can ensure efficiency with a refrigerator or freezer, but it really comes down to the components that comprise that appliance. Right. So generally, the cheaper the refrigerator's components, the less energy efficient it will be. A new, a new refrigerant blends, for example, are more energy efficient and less harmful to the environment than um, ones that you'd find in older models of, of fridges. And when it comes to components, the motor and the compressor of the fridge are the main sources of energy efficiency. So if you're ever out there, you know, if you're in the market for a new fridge, um, look for, uh, if possible, look for an electrically, electronically communicated fan motor, an EC fan motor or look for a variable frequency drive, a VFD, for the compressor of the refrigerator. That's how you will know you're getting like the most energy efficient refrigerator, all right? So we looked at fryers, we talked about refrigerators, quickly on the ventilation, right? So exhaust fans and range hoods can be more efficient by using premium energy efficient motors. Controls for these motors can also be incorporated to ensure efficiency. Uh, heat pump water heaters can also reclaim rejected heat from the kitchen and use it uh, for cooling domestic water heating and uh, or space heating and cooling. We talked about that before. So yeah, uh, a lot of, there's a couple other opportunities uh, for energy efficiency in the kitchen outside of um, that electric stove and using the heat pump, uh, heat pump water heaters, uh, et cetera, okay? All right, so quick review of what we have just surveyed, the electric uh, energy efficient kitchen equipment. Um, if you're interested to, if you're interested in finding specific pieces of commercial, commercial or residential energy efficient equipment, check out the Energy Star website. Um, the links are here in the slides. So basically energystar.gov slash product finder, okay? So we looked at dishwashers, we looked at uh, electric cooktops, we looked at um, range or wall ovens, we looked at fryers, refrigerators, and also ventilation. All of these things in the kitchen, and there are ways that we can increase energy efficiency in the kitchen. All right? So uh, we looked at space heating and cooling, we looked at domestic water heating, we looked at cooking, and now we're going to just review some other opportunities or energy efficient technology. So lighting, okay? So lighting now, I mean, I'm sure you're kind of, I'm, I'm personally kind of tired of hearing about lighting, but we still have a long way to go. I'm still seeing a lot of these incandescent bulbs everywhere, right? Lighting is the lowest hanging fruit for energy efficiency, okay? So now check out these comparisons um, where the brightness, that's the lumens of the bulb is held constant. Right, so you have a 60 watt incandescent bulb, right? That has the same brightness as a 14 watt uh, CFL bulb. That it has the and that all has the same brightness as a 12 watt uh, LED bulb, right? So that's the light emitting uh, diode. Um, right. Oh wait. Yep. So the brightness is 800. The yearly operating cost for the 60 watt incandescent bulb, like 
right? It uses 60 watts of electricity. Lifetime for that bulb, about 750 hours, all right? For the 14 watt CFL, uh, see, compare that yearly operating cost. It was 13 for the incandescent, it's $3 for the CFL. Um, it uses less watts and it has like a mag order of magnitude in lifetime. So the lifetime's 10,000 hours for the CFL. You want to get even better? All right, yes, yeah, so that's $58 lifetime savings. For the LED, we're going to call lighting constant. Yearly operating cost, even less than the CFL. Energy use, even less uh, than even less than the 14 watts for the CFL. And then the lifetime is, again, longer uh, than the than the than the CFL, right? 50,000 plus hours. And that totals uh, $200 in lifetime savings just for the one bulb. So again, this is low hanging fruit, just switching out incandescents uh, to LEDs, especially. LEDs is what we want to do, is where we want to get at, right? The US Department of Energy names the light emitting diode, the LED, as one of today's most energy efficient, cost effective, and rapidly developing lighting technologies. LED bulbs are better in every way. They last longer, they're more durable, and they provide better light quality. Okay, quick case study on lighting from the Lovell Federal Health Care Center in Chicago, right? So their goal, the goal for the center's Green, Energy, Green Environmental Management Systems Committee to reduce overall energy consumption, right? How did they do this? What was their strategy? Well, they were like, okay, let's just um, replace the fluorescent lighting with the light emitting diode, the LED bulbs, right? So they just made some lighting improvements. Again, really low hanging fruit, right? But the results, the energy consumption decreased by 15% in just one year. That means a savings of over $500,000 in 10 years, right? So it all adds up. Okay, uh, just a case study to show you that, yeah, lighting, everyone like kind of dismisses it, but it's low hanging fruit and it all adds up and you can like can get some pretty impactful savings um, just by switching out uh, to a cheaper bulb. Well, I mean, maybe the bulb itself is not cheaper, but again, marginal uh, costs going to be cheaper, lifetime costs, um, orders of magnitude cheaper. Other uh, other uh, opportunities, right? We have PV solar here as well. So again, you're not going to be able to see this video or hear this video if I play. So I'm going to put the link to this in the chat. Okay, I hope everyone can see that. Oh. All right, so quick YouTube um, video. It starts in at about 27 seconds. Ooh, having some trouble on end. Lots of bandwidth here, but it's just uh, two minutes. So it's just a quick video describing how solar PV works and how it helps to ease stress on the electric grid. PV solar.
All right, we should be finishing up with the video now. Awesome. Let's keep going. All right, so uh, secondary to the video, we have a quick case study also on PV solar, right? So uh, it's this case study is about the Donovans, right? Their goal was to um, get home to a net zero energy state. So basically, um, they are a household, their home, they did an energy audit of their home, and it showed that they had air leakage of a, nearly 60% of the air go, go, coming into their home was leaking out, right? So their utility bill averaged about $500 a month. Can you believe that? And sometimes it peaked at $700 a month. All right, so they wanted to get their home to a net zero energy state so that they at least had like more manageable and hopefully no uh, electricity bill, All right? So what was their strategy? They did home energy efficiency and solar PV retrofit, right? They took advantage of a 30% federal uh, tax credit, 30% um, federal tax credit uh, investment to offset the cost of their solar PV system. And that meant that their home will, has now uh, comfortable indoor temperatures and their report, they're reporting energy savings exceeding $6,000 per year. I mean, those electricity bill um, cost like $500 a month, that's a lot of money. So yeah, I would assume that they're seeing massive savings, um, yeah, over $6,000 a year, because now they make almost as much energy as they need. And they, of course, um, put in some energy efficiency retrofits that would typically include like just um, fixing up their uh, window fixtures and then adding some insulation, some insulation probably. But yeah, all of that combined, they're saving money hand over fist. So great for them. Good work, Donovans. Are there any questions? Any questions from the audience? Uh, feel free to come off mute, um, but also feel free to just put your questions in the chat. I'm looking at the chat. Oh, we're back up to 11 attendees. Uh, some people are here. <laughs> All right, so I'm feeling like not a whole bunch of questions. I'm not seeing anything. All right, hold your questions. Let's just press on. Electric vehicles. This is going to be probably the last uh, kind of other opportunity for efficiency that we are going to cover, right? So you may know that transportation is now the leading source of U.S. greenhouse gas emissions, and this makes electric vehicles, EVs, very attractive since they are tailpipe free. They produce no tailpipe emissions, right? So now, as we were mentioning, the grid can handle widespread EV adoption, but overnight widespread EV adoption could put stress on the electric grid. Like if everyone who drives a car, um, you know, in one day managed to trans manage to like switch or swap their car for an electric vehicle and then just everyone did this overnight and started plugging in and charging to drive the next morning, we would have kind of a situation on our hands. So uh, one way that can help reduce the stress on the grid is this um, is the possibility of vehicle to grid infrastructure. So that's EV charging infrastructure that supports capabilities to discharge energy um, to the grid from the electric vehicle's battery, right? So to put it simply, you can think of EVs as like a mobile energy storage device that you that can provide services to the grid in the same way that battery storage might, right? Uh, recent studies have shown that uh, it could cost cities 10 times more to upgrade the grid than to implement V2G and other programs to reduce grid stress, right? So basically instead of, so we're, we're, we might have a problem with the grid experiencing more demand than supply, but instead of um, like kind of just building more supply and building all that grid, uh, I guess like trend, um, th that distribution and, um, 
uh, that, that infrastructure to uh, support uh, more energy on the grid, uh, why don't we just find ways to uh, provide more energy to the grid short of those expensive um, infrastructure investments, right? So why don't we just use the batteries or the energy stored on our electric vehicle batteries? So very simply, V2G technology allows unused electricity in an EV's battery to be fed back into the electric grid. All right. I mean, that's that's a pretty simple uh, explanation, but I mean, I don't think we need to get too uh, further into the weeds unless you have specific questions. Happy to try to answer them. But uh, I wanted to show you guys this case study on electric vehicles. So, yes, it's from the UK. It's from uh, just uh, maybe like four, three, four years ago in the United Kingdom. But um, the goal was to encourage EV adoption while maintaining a stable electric grid, right? So, what was the strategy? Right, you they had like a V to G vehicle to grid pilot pilot program where uh, certain drivers and EV owners uh, signed up to participate and they got paid for the energy sold back to the grid from their EV. Right. So basically, um, the key component of this uh, of this pilot program was this intuitive AI software in the trial period that automatically charged the vehicles when renewable production was high. Right. And exported energy to the grid from the vehicle's battery when the supply was low and drivers were paid at the market rate of the energy um, at the time that it was being discharged back to the grid. And in the driver's case, in this pilot program, that was equivalent to thirty six dollars, more than thirty six dollars per kilowatt hour. Right. So if we can get the timing right, because there are some times when, when energy added to the grid, is basically worth nothing because there's a lot of other solar and wind coming on. The base, the grid is basically at capacity and there's not a lot of demand. But there are going to be times, you know, and we've seen this before, like California had a, a really uh, unfortunate experience with this a couple, maybe like 2000, in the like mid 2000s, um, when demand can totally outstrip supply. And that means at times like that, any electricity that's being fed to the grid has a premium price. So as we can see from this uh, case study, uh, that AI software was automatically like selecting like the best times to discharge the vehicle and to recharge the vehicle based on the, um, the scenario that's playing out in the grid at the current time, right? And so the participating drivers, they got paid like mad money, like $36 per kilowatt hour. That's a lot, right? Um, that's about, that's almost a thousand dollars a year. If they were to do this year round, all things being considered equal, um, the participants um, could earn as much as, uh, well, almost $900 a year by just keeping their car plugged into the charger when not in use, right? And that uh, smart, uh, that like AI software um, installed on the chargers, you can, the participating drivers could use an app on their phones to tell the platform when they need their car to be ready in the morning so um, so that the program will know when would be the best time to discharge so that there's enough time to recharge the, the battery by the time the driver is ready to use it right so I mean uh, really so much technology happening right here but I mean the results are pretty impressive right so using this um, pilot as a baseline uh, and assuming that the UK achieves its goals for EV adoption, it's, uh, it is projected that total EV discharging capability per year could provide about 16 gigawatts of daily flexible energy capacity to the grid. That is huge. That's huge. That dynamism and that flexibility will be needed more and more as renewable energy um, becomes a greater share of uh, electricity generated. Okay, great. Um, so quick break here, but are there any questions? Any questions at all? That was pretty exciting stuff. I love to read about electric vehicles and really the future that we're living in. We're like right in the future electric vehicles powering homes oh man such an exciting time any questions any questions 
Okay, uh, well, we're scheduled to take like a five minute break here. Um, so I'll be back at like um, just about uh, 15 minutes to the hour. Okay, 
So that was about five minutes. Um, I hope you guys got that turkey out and into the oven or whatever else you might be doing. I bet you're all like just preparing for the holidays. I hope it is awesome for all of you. I hope you guys get some rest. I wish that also for myself. <laughs> But uh, let's just quickly wrap up. We only have like one more section to go and it's probably the most uh, most relevant one um, for you all. Uh, but first, before we get into the last section, we have a quick check for understanding. Check for understanding number two. Take out your smartphones. You can join at that QR code or at slido.com. All right, so. The leading source of energy consumption in commercial and residential buildings is, is it space heating and cooling? Is it cooking? Is it lighting? Or is it the use of small electronic devices? I see some people participating. Yeah. All right, one person said space heating and cooling. Which is the correct answer? <laughs> and then um, the primary way that energy efficient technologies, that is heat pumps, heat pump water heaters, and energy efficient kitchen equipment ease challenges to electrification is they a, decrease energy consumption, B, increase energy demand, or C, only use renewables as an energy source? The correct answer is the first one. They decrease energy consumption overall, right? Excellent. Excellent. Thank you, my lovely participants. I appreciate it. Oops, sorry. Go back here. But yeah, everyone got those right. Now let's talk about incentives, as I promised. These are offerings that will help encourage the adoption of energy efficient technologies by lowering the cost barriers for businesses and for individuals. So from our previous mention, we will review federal, state, and local incentives. So um, incentives uh, overcome the challenge to cost. There are federal incentives currently um, through the Inflation Reduction Act. One of the goals of the Inflation Reduction Act is to lower consumer energy costs. To achieve this goal, many incentives and rebates will be made available to lower income households and disadvantaged communities. These incentives and rebates will include direct consumer rebates, how Con direct consumer rebates um, for households buying heat pumps or other energy efficient home appliances, uh, tax credits for installing rooftop solar, and tax credits for new and used electric vehicles. That is so crucial because for a long time, you could only get that tax credit. Well, not for a long time, since they've introduced a tax credit, you can only get it if the vehicle you're buying is new. And we know that for a lot of uh, lower income households, they were never going to buy a new car to begin with. Um, but use electric vehicles, um, it really depends on you know the previous owner or owners. But typically those batteries, those vehicle batteries still have a lot of density left, even after 12, 15 years. So, you know, depending on your driving patterns and your needs, a used electric vehicle could be just what you're looking for and they're coming in at a fraction of the price and now you can get a federal tax credit as well so that's awesome um, another uh, challenge to or another way to overcome challenge to cost is by just uh, you know incentives for retrofits and new construction so Seattle City Light offers incentives that can help new or retrofitted buildings switch to alternative fuels or adopt energy conservation technologies. This would include heat pumps um, and other uh, incentives as well. We're gonna take a look at a list of them. Um, so incentives are available for commercial, industrial, and multifamily projects, um, but they're, uh, they come in like different buckets. So for new construction, so this is for new buildings that are going up. If it's a new multifamily building that's being constructed, you can get incentives to um, purchase washers and dryers for the building, uh, to um, heat the water. So we talked about you know, 
heat pump water heaters. And you can get also some incentives to improve the whole building's uh, energy efficiency, right? And then uh, for the com for commercial and industrial incentives, you can get uh, there are a bunch of like miscellaneous uh, incentives that you can get. And um, then there are the building envelope ones, and then there are there are other whole building um, ones as well. And we're going to look at um, some source documents. So I'm going to ask you to review, but uh, this is just for an introduction, right? So Seattle City Lights they have new construction incentives for multifamily and for commercial and, in, and industrial projects. And then they have retrofit incentives as well. So if you already have an existing commercial, industrial, or multifamily home, um, there are some uh, incentives that you can get from Seattle City Light that can help you um, make your existing building uh, a little more energy efficient, right? Reduce those existing energy costs. So that can be for lighting, that can be for uh, specific to data centers and for IT equipment. Uh, again, for water heating with those heat pump water heaters, for HVAC, heating, ventilation, air conditioning, uh, multifamily weatherization um, for, for multifamily buildings, and then of course for refrigeration as well, right? So whether you are about to uh, take on a project or you have um, like a, a commercial, industrial, or multifamily building already, um, there are a lot of uh, helpful um, incentives from Seattle City Light that can help you reduce your costs. All right. Okay. So now uh, these are, I'm going to put in the chat uh, the links to the incentives offered by Seattle City Light. Okay. So both for the retrofit um, and for the new construction incentives. And I would like everybody to just take a couple minutes, right? Review the incentives on the sheet or on, on each sheet, right? And then tell me what the incentive program is or just like make a note. What is the incentive program and how does it ease the end users to electrify. So I want you to pick one. Uh, I'm sorry. I want you to pick one from both the uh, retrofit and uh, a new construction incentive. Okay. So for each of them, what is the incentive program that you've chosen, and how does it ease the end user's cost to electrify? All right. So I'll give you maybe like five minutes to do that. That'll take us to two fifty-seven. I'm sorry, uh, yeah, 57 minutes.
Okay, lovely audience. Are we done checking out those uh, incentives programs offered by SCL? So again, I wanted you to choose one retrofit incentive and one new construction incentive, and then just tell me about the incentive program and how it eases the end user's cost to electrify. Okay, we have a Slido poll coming up next. Okay. All right, so pretty straightforward. So I can see for that retrofit project, um, so it's lighting. Then um, multifamily weatherization based on the number of floors uh, that the multifamily building. I don't see anyone responding. <laughs> okay, one person said that they can articulate incentives that help ease the end user's cost to electrify. That's great. That's just what we're looking for. And all of that is on those two sheets. So quick reference. Okay, so the respondent um, looked at multifamily weatherization, uh, the windows, insulation, and doors. Um, so this helps, uh, in, so the weatherization insulates units better, which reduces the need for space heating and cooling. That's perfect. Excellent, thank you. All right, so quick course recap. Electrification is the replacement of technologies that use fossil fuels as their energy source with technologies that use electricity. The, there are utility bill savings, of course, but there are also health, safety, comfort, and climate benefits to electrification as well. Maintaining grid stability and the cost of electricity are both challenges to electrification. And using energy efficient technology, as well as federal, state, and local incentives are two ways to help mitigate those challenges to electrification. That's grid stability and the cost of electrifying. So final exit survey for anyone who's still with me. What were your key takeaways from today? What were your key takeaways from today? What worked well? And do you have any suggestions to make our upcoming trainings valuable? Thank you so much for your participation. Yeah, your responses are gonna be really helpful to us as we continue to craft these trainings. Appreciate it. Oh, I'm seeing something here.
Yes, there are. So key takeaways from today, electrification has challenges that are direct, that directly relate to the infrastructure. If the infrastructure is not upgraded to be prepared for mass electrification, we will always have a big hurdle to get over. Right, so the, yeah, uh, infrastructure upgrades are important, but I hope you can remember from uh, what we've talked about today that there are a lot of things that uh, individual consumers, like consumers of electricity, can do to help grid uh, maintain its stability, right? And a lot of it is just using more uh, energy efficient technology, right? And then someone else said that there are many technology solutions to achieving electrification. That's all correct. What has worked well? Case studies and outside sources. Excellent. Um, any suggestions? Nope, it was great. Thank you. No, thank you. Thank you, my lovely audience. Everyone who's still sticking around, thank you all so much for your time today and have a very happy, um, prosperous and relaxing holiday filled with family and food. Happy Thanksgiving, everybody. Thank you, it. everyone, for attending. Thank you, Cher, so much. Um, and hope to see y'all back for HVAC systems testing uh, next week. All right, have a good Thanksgiving. I'm going to shut us down, Cher. I don't see any other questions or anything in the chat. Excellent. Thank you. All right, bye, everyone.